Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Merry Christmas. We're so glad that you're here. For those of you watching online, we're so glad you've joined in with us today. Let's stand up together in this room. Let's worship Jesus, our risen Savior, our King. Come on.
with Jesus. So I want to ask you to be seated. We're going to watch this story together and continue in an attitude of praise and worship as we celebrate together this morning. I didn't have a relationship with God growing up and I and most of my friends uh, were agnostic, I would say. I just always felt like I had questions. I, I, I really didn't have a relationship with God until I came, until I moved to Texas. I had just gotten a tattoo in California, and the next day, I had gone into a lake. <laughs> I wrapped up the tattoo pretty heavily, but I went into a lake with all the bacteria and everything that could possibly affect it. So my girlfriend said, how could you do that? I don't want you to get infected. And, and so I said, uh, pray for me. I said, pray for me that it doesn't get infected even though not really knowing what prayer was, and sure enough, it didn't get infected. And I said, uh, you know what? I'll go to church with you when I get to Texas. And she, she held me to it. <laughs> the, the first day the, that we came uh, was baptism weekend, and watching those people and their stories was very emotional and very inspiring. And when I was asked if I wanted to do that soon, I felt like I needed time to commit myself just like any relationship. When I am able to get baptized, I wanted to be able to speak those words and to truly mean them. When we finally came to, to prepare, we, we sat in the, the main hall uh, the first two nights. And on the third night, they, it was over capacity. So we had to sit in the, the video venue room. And uh, I just remember watching the, the message and um, <laughs> also the first time that I had fasted. So I was feeling uh, hungry <laughs> and also I, I was getting more in touch with, with God and realizing that this is what I want. So at the end of the message, they said, you know, pray, pray this prayer with us. So I did give my life to, to Jesus. A lot of questions that I had growing up about God and, and the church were definitely being answered. So when I gave my life to the Lord, I knew that I definitely wanted, wanted to get baptized. And so I found out that it was going to be um, December 5th, and I said I, that's four days before my 35th birthday, and I decided that I absolutely want to get baptized. The first thought that I'm going to have uh, coming out of the tank will be, 
completion. I will feel complete. And I feel that my relationship with the Lord will be stronger than ever. And that I will actually have a father that I didn't have growing up. Y'all, come on, put your hands together. Give it up. Come on, give it up. This is Jay. <laughs> Y'all, when somebody who identifies as an agnostic surrenders their life to Jesus, that's supernatural. That's God alone that touches that heart. That's powerful. I'm telling you, if we had time, if I had time to tell every single story backstage of the people that are going to be baptized this morning, let me tell you what's happening. You're in a chair right now, kind of watching two guys stand in water. What's happening between us and what's happening in Jay's life is deeply profound. This is a memory he will never forget. This is a life marking moment for him. We get a chance to celebrate that together. That's pretty awesome. And that's pretty exciting. So give it up one more time for Jay. Thank you for sharing your story. It takes some transparency. I really appreciate it. I want to ask you this. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Jay, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love that. Come on, Jax. No fear. He's backstage. I asked him if he was ready for this. He's like, yeah, yeah. So the cool thing about Jax's story is his dad, Glenn, gave his life to Christ two years ago, and mom, Lauren, gave her life to Christ about, uh, well, in October. yeah, in October, pretty recent, uh, here at Milestone. And so you've got mom and dad with a new relationship with Christ. Jax is out here sitting in the same seats you guys are, and he said, I want that. I want that. So now the whole family has a relationship with Jesus. Pretty cool, huh? Proud of you, man. This is a big step. Jax, I want to ask you this. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. Based on that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but this is Lindsay. Proud of you, Lindsay. Big step you're taking. I know how meaningful this moment is for you. I want to ask you this, Lindsay. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that profession of faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We got the whole family coming. This is Mackenzie. And then we got mom and dad coming down here. How many of you know, I, I shared with you the story about Jax, but this is so cool when a family gets transformed like this. Isn't it awesome to see just Jesus working in people's lives? Mackenzie, I want to ask you this. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that profession of faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Karen, Karen, I want to ask you the same question. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. Based on that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, John. Listen, God's calling you to a new place of leadership in your family. You're going to set the tone in your home. It's a spiritual place. It's an environment that you create, that... that, that that atmosphere, you bring a spirit of peace and love, leadership to your home, proud of you, okay? God's got some things in your future. John, I wanna ask you this, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Well, based on that profession, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody, this is Tallulah. Tallulah, proud of you. It's a big step you're taking. I know God's got some amazing things in store for you. I want to ask you this. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that profession of faith, 
I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, Jackson. You ready? It's a life-marking moment, man. God's got big plans for you. You know that? I'm proud of you. So are we. We can't wait to see what Jesus does in your life moving forward, man. I want to ask you this. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Based on that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, y'all. That's awesome. Stand to your feet. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just stand up here amazed and grateful at all the life change we see happening. What an amazing thing. It it can only be you. It's you, God, doing a work in people's lives. And I know you're continuing to do that, God. You're going to do things in these folks' lives that are going to be amazing as they continue to grow in you. So, God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, to you be the glory. God, you are that treasure rich and rare. God, we thank you. We get to see your beauty on display in the lives of these people in baptism, the amazing work you've done in their lives. And now we get to sit front row and just watch just your wonder, just the awe of just seeing you transform families, individuals, agnostics, just people coming to you. It's kids coming to you saying, yes, I have. I'm going to follow you, Lord, transforming lives for our very eyes. God, we do give you the glory. We thank you for the work that you've done, the work you're yet to do, and what you're going to speak to us today. Jesus, in your name, amen. Amen, Miles. So what an awesome morning. You may go ahead and have a seat. Love getting to worship with you. Also getting to 
I witnessed these uh, beautiful baptism stories uh, with you as well. And I know we have a lot of friends and family of individuals that have gotten baptized are here today and also are tuning in, watching online to support them. And I know you're here for them, but also uh, God's here for you today. We're believing that he's got something special uh, for you today as you're here with us. And we have other guests coming to Milestone Church, kicking off our Christmas uh, series here. We have a lot of guests coming in. And so thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, just joining us for worship. We wanna send you a gift in the mail. And so all we need is some basic information from you. In the seat back, there's a little card. It's called a connection card. And then online, the service host is putting that up on the screen or in the chat for you as well. If you just let us know uh, you're here or you're watching online, we're gonna send you a fun gift. So I had a lady after the service last week, she came to me, she's like, thank you so much for that. you know. And so it's something that you'll actually be excited to receive. And so, because we are excited you're here, let us know, fill it out, either drop it in the box or do it online and we'll get that in the mail to you this week and tell you about some next steps of engagement. Uh, the first one of those is Discovery 101. And many of you are signed up for that today. It's after this service, 1230, right out these doors. We're ready for you if you're signed up for that. We got a great group coming today. And in fact, such a large group, we start another one next week. So there's another one coming up next Sunday if you wanna attend that. Uh, we'd love to meet you at that. You can use that connection card to sign up or sign up at the info center in the commons. And also there's a link online there for you that the host is providing too. Uh, we are not passing giving containers, but what we are doing is giving through the giving boxes and also online through the app and Milestone Church website. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. Um, some big things coming up, uh, one of which this week, Ladies Joy 2020 coming up this week. Y'all excited? Yeah. I know you are. We got a lot of you signed up. We got multiple nights in multiple venues across the, the region here and uh, also online. So all the on-site stuff is sold out but uh, online is unlimited, okay? And so if you've not signed up for that, you wanna be a part, uh, you can join us online. And also you can either attend a watch party or even better, host a watch party. We've got hundreds of these watch parties happening. And so right in your home, you can have some friends and family over and be part of Joy uh, this week. All right, well, I got one more announcement for you. One I'm really, really uh, excited about to share with you. Um, so, a lot of you know Pastor Jeff as an amazing communicator, pastor, leader of our church, but what you don't see is kind of the one-on-one, -on -one, the day-to-day. -day. And what I think one of the things he is the best at is developing men, it's about developing men in the areas that matter most, to, to really know God and to, to serve their wives and to, to lead their families and to walk in not just a career, but the calling and purpose God has for them and these areas that he's walked with men for years. And, over 15 years ago, he started a process. And I was part of that first group of a process to really put these things in men, to get them in the Bible and these, these values in them. And for years we were saying, okay, teach us to do it so we can help other men grow and lead. And so we've been doing that and building this, this resource and so much so that we're like, okay, now we need to provide it in a resource that not just you or us, but we can put this in the hands of somebody and they can experience the same thing. And so I'm excited to announce that early next year, so spring of 2021, we're releasing Pastor Jeff's new book, The Way to Win, which is this resource to develop men, which is so awesome and so needed. So that's coming out. It's got a nice four by John Maxwell, which was so kind of him. But who wants to wait? I don't. And so I pushed and pushed and others pushed and pushed and bootleg copies started getting made and distributed. And so I'm like, look, we need this before Christmas. And so it is available to the Milestone family here and online uh, before even we re -rele re release it. We're gonna have it available. So it's available today, the next couple of weeks, because here's the thing, I want every single man in Milestone Church to be able to get this book and get this content in your heart, but also all the, the ladies here, this is something for your husband, for the men, for your sons. And then not only that, what I'm really excited about, why I push so hard personally, is because I have a lot of family. I've got my, my dad, I've got my brothers, I got people I wanna get this in their hand. I believe if I get it in their hand, then then God's gonna get it in their heart. And so uh, that's, that's why I was pushing so hard, others pushing so hard to have it built for Christmas, because I think it can be life-changing for some man in your family, some boy in your family, if they get this in their hand. So it's available out there uh, for us. You can get that in the, at the info center after the service, or you can get it online at the Milestone Church website. All right, we are kicking off uh, the Christmas series today. Uh, before Pastor Jeff comes though, we have some special music, but why don't you turn around and find somebody you don't know and just kind of tell them, hey, good to see you today at Milestone Church.
Welcome you to this first week as we begin our journey toward Christmas. I want to welcome those watching in our video venues here at the Keller campus, 
All of those that are online that are part of the Milestone family as well as guests and those of you watching at 1230, would you guys put your hands together and welcome, welcome all those that are joining us. We're glad you're with us today. Well, I'm excited about this time of year and I have to be transparent with you. I have been emotionally moved all weekend. Um, I know this is your service that you're particularly a part of, but I have watched service after service as I've seen husbands and wives and children and men and women go public with their faith and it, it never gets old. <clears throat> In a year where we've been distracted by so many things, I have to tell you, it refreshes my soul to see that there's a lot of narrative out there, but Jesus' message is still ruling and reigning in the earth. And uh, he is seeking and saving that which is lost. He's still on his throne, and I've just been moved all weekend. Again, I've seen couples, husbands, wives, uh, a service where we started with a, a lady in, in the tank there, just been through brokenness and challenges in her life. And you could just see God doing amazing things. Um, and then, of course, Jay's testimony is very moving. So God's presence has been here with us all weekend. And I'm excited to share with you a message this weekend that actually is a little bit unique and rare because last year, during one of our 20-something Christmas services, um, I enjoy all the music. I enjoy everything about the services. I have since I was a kid. I just, I love church, you know. I'm kind of a weird church person. I guess it goes good with my profession. But anyway, I, um, I, I love it all. But I happen to be, during one of the services, uh, having a thought. You know, Lord, uh, Christmas is going to come next year. And... You could really help the preacher out if you'd kind of give me a little idea, you know, about next year. And so I just started praying a little bit during the service and thinking, you know, it's coming and there's only like one story. So I have to share some messages. Can you help me out? You know, usually it's like the week of, you know, I mean, it, I just decided to get started a little early and I, I felt the whisper of the Holy Spirit tell me next year, I want you to preach on fear. And I went back in between one of the little segments before I came out and I told one of the team members that work with me, I said, don't let me forget this. I feel like God just spoke to me and said, next Christmas, talk about fear. So then I was committed. I went back to my seat during one of the next services, maybe number 17 or 18 at that point. And I began to think, wait a minute, what does fear have to do with Christmas? Isn't that Halloween? I thought it was supposed to be deck the halls, you know? It's supposed to be Yuletide, Christmas, Merry Christmas! And then I began to think, you know, I've heard the Christmas story since I was a kid and I started thinking about it and I thought, you know, it does say, do not be afraid several times in it. I'm gonna ask you if you have your Bibles this weekend to turn with me to Luke chapter two, Verses 8 through 11, we're going to look at one segment of the Christmas story, but on our way there, then I will give you a couple of other passages as well as we think about how to overcome fear during Christmas. And I also began to think about this message this week as I was on a walk with my wife in our neighborhood. We were walking along through our neighborhood and she looked over at one of our neighbors and she said, Jeff, we need one of those. It was a nice, big, lit up nativity scene. She said, I want a nativity scene. I said, baby doll, you are beautiful. Have I told you lately how beautiful you are? But um, that's not going to happen. We don't need that. Remember, I'm a preacher. I don't have tools. Who's going to put it together? Where are we going to store it? What will we do with it? And she's like, well, look, he has one and they have this and he has Mickey Mouse. And I said, and I'm fine being a Christmas loser. I'm perfectly fine with it. I'm totally okay with being a Christmas loser in my neighborhood. And besides that, you have been progressively building up to what we have now. We now have lights all over the house. You talked me into a few years ago lighting the yard. And then we lit the driveway. 
And we have teenage drivers and they have run over the lights twice. I just want you to know <laughs> they've run over them. So I don't think we need a nativity scene. By the way, we have a nativity scene. We have one. Here it is. It's one of our favorite little pieces of Christmas decor. When Brandy and I were early in our marriage, we had the opportunity to go to Israel, and so we actually bought this nativity scene in Bethlehem. It's made from real olive wood. My kids love to set it up, and so we have a nativity scene. We don't need a lit up one that you can see from space. We don't need it out there. We have one. I started thinking about nativity scenes, and maybe you have one, maybe in your front yard. Cheers to you, or you have one at your house. But I began to think about this iconic symbol of Christmas and how it has this perfect little setting and there's baby Jesus and there's all the people gathered and there's a nice little hue and a nice little light and it speaks to all is well, everything's good, peace, calm, joy, Christmas. But if you really know the story of what those people were walking through, there were a lot of reasons to be afraid. The basics of how they did life, the challenges they had culturally, the challenges they have economically, and this phrase that God uses, by the way, not just in the Christmas story, but all the way through the Bible, don't be afraid. If you will put it in modern terms, why are you so scared? Why are you so full of fear? Don't be afraid. 365, 366 times in the Bible, it's like, don't be afraid. And it's in the Christmas story. You may not know that. It's not just Merry Christmas. It's do not be afraid. I'll look at some of the aspects of where that's found three times in the main story. One is Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She's troubled. He hasn't said anything troubling. He said, you have a lot of favor and I'm going to be with you. Ha! Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. The angel said to her, Mary, you have found favor with God. Joseph Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, in Matthew 1, 20, Joseph, the son of David, do not be afraid, take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now let's think about this to do justice to the text. I don't want to simplify just our world of 2020, where a year ago the Holy Spirit knew that we would need to hear about fear. A few weeks after that, he told me our word for the church was purity for this year. I'm believing for overflow or jubilee this next year, just so you know. I'm going to kind of banter with God if he gives me these purity and fear words again. But anyway, he knew where we would be. This idea of fear to do justice to the text would not be let's just superimpose our modern world living into just our fears. The fact of the matter is, in context, God has been silent for 400 years. He's making a radical shift. In the Old Testament, there were only special people that could encounter this holy, great, and awesome God. So just to be clear, if that God comes in the midst of normal, frail humanity, you might have some fear. So there is the practical of the glory of the Lord, the greatness of this all-powerful God with a different perspective where it's like, whoa. But if you really study the story and look at it, I don't believe that we're taking great theological liberty to only say that they're just afraid because they're encountering an almighty God, but it's also what he's going to ask them to do. What he's going to ask of their participation And there's where we really can relate to the story. It's not just that when I get in the presence of God, I sense my inadequacies in comparison to his greatness, that I have a tendency to understand where I've willfully walked away from his desires for me. It's not that I just feel that, it's that how will he contradict my mindset 
to ask me to participate in what he's doing in the earth because every time he does, if I don't look at it the right way, he's got to remind me, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So it's what he's asking them to do. Luke chapter two, verse eight, another big key part of the Christmas story. These shepherds, they're living out in the fields nearby. They're keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Look what it says. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. So obviously this is an apex, crescendo, critical moment in human history where now humanity who has tried to do the right things to be pleasing to a perfect and holy God, he is changing the game to say, now I wanna come as Emmanuel, I wanna dwell with you, I wanna be with you, I wanna make an eternal relationship with you. And it is a powerful thing when we see people make a decision to follow Jesus, it affects eternity. Heaven is a real place, hell is a real place, but the Bible says eternal life is actually to know God. And there's a longing inside of every human soul, no matter how much they stack up in their 401k or accomplishments or trophies that they hang on the wall, there's an ache inside of the human soul to be with the God who created them. And he's saying, I'm making it a way, I'm making a way and making it possible for that to happen now. I'm changing the game here. It is a major moment, yet, if we really think about it, The Christmas story is much like a lot of the other stories in the Bible where God says, I want to do this in your life. I want to do it through you. I'm asking for your participation, but there's one big barrier. At every step in your journey with Jesus, fear can paralyze you. Here's the importance of understanding fear. It's not just that we have fear or we are afraid, but when we live in fear, if we let fear take its dominant position over the truth of God's word, what it does is it sticks us, it paralyzes us in our current state. I would love to tell you that you outgrow it. I would love to tell you that you can come to enough church services and you can listen to enough sermons to not be afraid, but I know people further in their journey, they're more afraid than the people who just got dumped. Because fear is an interesting thing. It's a very interesting thing. There are casual fears, but there are all types of fears, by the way. I was asking my family just because I was thinking about this service. I said, what are you afraid of? My daughter, 16-year-old, Lauren, she said, I'm afraid of clowns. I don't know if there was a trauma that happened at a birthday party or why that happened or probably some scary movie that her brother showed her, but she said, I'm afraid of clowns. My son said he was afraid of wells. I'm afraid of a phobia that you may not know. It's pelidophobia, the fear of bald people. (laughs) There's one that we all have this time of year that I looked up, cynogenesphobia, cynogenesophobia. It's the fear of relatives, so that's a different message, okay? We'll talk about that later in the Christmas season. As humorous as it is, what about the fear of failure? What about the fear of rejection? What about the fear of financial ruin? What about the fear of your child not becoming what you view they should be and the fear that you caused it? What about the fears that plague all of us? By the way, you're saying fear, is all fear bad fear? Is it everything? Well, the fact is God made us biologically and chemically to respond to a crisis with a adrenaline dose, a, a biological process that causes us to recognize things that could harm us. And in a short burst of time, actually fear can be of benefit to us to help us avoid being destroyed, but over a long period of time, it's toxic. Over an extended period of time, that's why I'm saying it's not wrong to be afraid, it's it's wrong to live afraid. To live afraid means you have a toxic thing happening not only in your spiritual well-being, but your biological well-being that leads to anxiety, that leads to depression, that leads to other crutches that you try to find to get you out of it, and the hope is 
that we would take the words that are coming to us in the Christmas story and the words of the Bible to not be afraid. You're like, okay, I got you. I don't want to be paralyzed. I don't want to be stuck. I don't want to live in fear. Maybe you're online and you're thinking, I just tuned into this. This guy knows where I live. No, the Bible knows where we live. How do you overcome fear? Number one, you have to understand this. Being afraid doesn't keep us from being with God. Now let me unpack something that I picked up on along the way. I've used like you that I thought a thought growing up in church, I don't know where I got it. I don't know how it came. It makes a lot of rational sense. It just doesn't align with the Bible. And that is that we have this concept of God that if God's in it, everything's smooth. We use words like, well, I'm just going to pray that the Lord opens the door. I don't have time to preach it to you, but there's a moment where there was a supernatural call by the Apostle Paul into a setting where the Bible does say, a great wide door for effective service has been opened, but you don't want to read what happened after they walked through the door. There's this idea that says, well, if it's all perfect, if there's no challenges, if there's no problems, if I don't have to in any way use faith or confidence in God's word, then man, I am actually cooperating with God, but maybe God's not in the midst of your desire to protect yourself from anything that would make you afraid, period. Actually, what we do in our culture, and we have the ability to analyze every scenario now, in former days, we didn't have access to as much stuff to analyze. Now we can analyze and we get analysis paralysis and figure out everything. The people of the Bible and the people even 50 years ago, they should have been a lot more scared. They just didn't know what they needed to be scared of. But now we have all the ability to analyze every possible scenario and outcome that could cause us to be afraid. The real tragedy of it, we think that God actually wants that for our lives and that if there's any fear present, then God's not in it. Actually, we idolize and worship fear by bringing it to its own altar so that we don't have to experience it. We bring it to that place and we substitute it for the God who says, no, I'll be with you. I'll be with you in what makes you afraid. I'll actually maybe even be more present and favoring you and being with you in the things that you have reason to be afraid of. So actually, life in the kingdom doesn't take much of a little crisis to begin to surface these things in our lives. The challenges in our lives, I want to clarify to every person listening, living under the lordship of Jesus Christ Submitting your full life to him will be a journey that is exhilarating, exciting, and it's amazing, and you will be in awe of God at every turn. But it is not fear-free. It is not fear-free. It's like my kids' Starbucks drinks. They are so free of everything, I'm trying to figure out what's actually in them. You can have it fat-free, lactose-free, sugar-free. You can have it all free. Well, some people have bought into a Christianity that is so fear-free, it's not Christianity at all. It's not following Jesus at all. Because following Jesus means, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I want to take you here at every turn along the way. Let me unpack fear for a minute because some of you are like, okay, I got you. Uh, it's, it, 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 uh, let me unpack it, though, and expose it for the lie that it is and give you a little deeper understanding of it. Recognize fear is a spirit, so it's irrational, okay? Fear is a spirit, so it's irrational, okay? Once you understand this, you probably have a little more equipment to fight it. This is very important. I don't think everyone understands that fear is a spirit. Think about it in the Christmas story. Mary, you are highly favored, I am with you. Ah! He said nothing that's scary. He had nothing to say to her that was that scary. Now, he, she's in the presence of God, so she probably has some fear related to that. But, but, but every one of us would want to hear that you are highly favored and I'm with you. And like God himself tell us that, it'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm still scared. But look, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, it's, it's like, wow. So there is a belief, and I know all of us have it that I will arrive to a place in life where I will have so much securities upon securities and backup plans upon backup plans because of my genius analysis that I will be in such a protected place that I will never feel afraid. 
And you know what? If God would come out of heaven, actually, preacher, I appreciate what you're preaching, but look, I'm listening to you and you're just saying all that. But like, if God himself would show that to me, like if God would really tell me you have nothing to be scared of, I'm with you. And he'd kind of do like an angel thing. I wouldn't be scared. Yes, you would. You would. There's no scenario that gives you in the natural enough confidence that fear doesn't operate because fear is not logical. Fear is not practical. Fear is not in any way based on the concrete information of the way you make decisions. It's a spirit. So it's irrational and it comes into our lives. Some of you say, well, fear is not a spirit. Where'd you get that? Well, 2 Timothy 1, 7. By the way, young families, I had my kids right after John 3, 16 memorize this. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is a spirit that travels through the open doors of the way we do life and comes to lodge itself in our souls. And you say, why is it important to know that it's a spirit? Because you're looking to combat it in the rational and wonder why you stay so afraid. You can't combat it in the rational. You have to combat it in the spiritual. It's a spirit. Here's the third thing. And that is, let's look at what to actually do. Expect to have fearful moments, but realize you don't have to live in fear. Now, some of you say, you never get afraid, Pastor Jeff. No, is that, you're preaching this with so much confidence. I'm preaching it from revelation because I'm living what I'm preaching to you. Multiple reasons. Life, as you journey through it, presents multiple reasons and multiple opportunities to be afraid. We all have it. I have irrational moments of thoughts of fear. I have kids moving out of the house. I have building projects, things, things in the lives of people. And if I let it and succumb to it, the spirit of fear can dominate my life the same way it can dominate yours. There's some things I've learned along the way. There's some things I've picked up and I wanna give them to you that are practical. Like you're like, okay, I got you. I'm with you. Somebody listening online, I got you. What do we actually do? What do we actually do in this situation? Well, here's four things I've learned from people in 25 years of pastoring people and walking with people and in my own life. Here's some things they do to overcome fear. These are some different ways of viewing the world through a biblical lens that can help you with fear. Number one, they trust the character of God. They ultimately trust more in the character of God than they do in the spirit and feelings and scenarios and expert, everybody around them trying to tell them what is true. They ultimately trust the faithfulness and the character of God. That's where they ultimately land. Fact is, we go through things in life, but if anyone here, I'm not minimizing the brokenness of what people go through. You're like, pastor, if you knew what I've been through, Look, as a pastor, I know, I understand. I've walked with many people through their most painful moments. But I will say this, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been or what you've been through, if you take an honest look at your life, even through the challenging things, God has a way to make good out of those. And if we really look at God's resume, let's look at his honest resume, not what the spirit of fear says about God's character. Fear ascribes and subscribes to God's nature and character a whole lot of things that are not really on his resume. He has truly been faithful to us. He has been faithful unto all generations. I think about the story with the apostle Peter, and I think about this sometimes even in my own life when fear tries to take a grip because it's really what you're trusting in. What are you really trusting in? Your ability to avoid fear, your ability to look to someone who will tell you to not be afraid. God, I mean, what are you really trusting in? I think about the apostle Peter who made some mistakes, but he walked on water. You know what I'm saying? I just love the fact that he tried. I just love the fact he didn't make it all the way, but he walked a few steps. And there's a little phrase in there that really caught me that just I'm drawn to, and that is he's walking okay. He's looking at Jesus. He's out there on the water. He's taking a few steps, right? You say, well, I'm never going to walk on water. He's going to ask you to walk on water. Get out of the boat. Do this. Start that business. Step out for God. 
Be really who you say you are. Don't just live one way during the week and another way on Sunday. Do whatever he asks you to do. He's going to ask you to do something at some point. If you get close to him, I hear a lot of people say, I just wish God would talk to me. Have you read the book? Every time he talks, it's like, ha! Ah! Don't be afraid. Get out of the boat, Peter. He's walking. He's walking. And the Bible says he focused and looked at the wind. He began to look at the wind. He took his eyes off Jesus. He starts looking at the wind. I tell you, this year, we have done a lot of focusing on the wind, but we haven't done a lot of focusing on Jesus. A lot of wind focus. Looking at the wind starts to sink. And this is what I love about Jesus. The Bible says he took him by the hand. He took him by the hand and pulled him up out of that situation. At the end of the day, you know what keeps you from living in fear? Is which hand do you grab? Who can pull me out of this? I'm going with Jesus. I'm going with his word. I'm standing on those promises. You trust the true character and nature of God. Here's the next one. They don't feed their fear. People that don't live in fear don't feed their fear. I mean, I say this a lot, but you know what? I could say it every Sunday. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Whatever you focus on, you get full of. Some of you need to disconnect your feeds. You're so anxious because you're listening, and a lot of it, by the way, is not even true. It is clickbait because if it is fear-based, if it bleeds, it leads. It gets the top spot because it makes you scared. And the enemy just wreaks havoc on people. Just havoc, just, just, just absorbing all of this. There are things I do not read. There are things I do not watch. There are things I do not look at. And there are people I don't hang out with because I don't need to feed my fear. I got plenty. I don't need any more. I don't need any extra. Whatever you feed grows. So do a little fear evaluation of what you're feeding. Here's the next thing. They have people who help them. Here's the cool thing about this kingdom thing. As soon as you give your life to Christ and you baptized, I really believe these people who just got baptized this week, they're going to run into someone who's a step behind them. That's the cool thing about it. He doesn't wait until you've been to seminary, know the whole Bible. In fact, he sent the disciples out as lambs in the midst of wolves. They didn't know a lot. He said, you guys are in the game. So what happens is you get one step toward Jesus and he's gonna show you someone that is a half a step. And then you get a chance to go, I don't know much about this Bible, but I do know Jesus saves people. Do you want that? <laughs> I, knew, I do know you can go to heaven and not hell. So you'll get someone who's a little bit a step baby back and as you're mentoring and discipling people, I'm so glad that we have built our church on reaching the lost making disciples in the context of spiritual family, that never goes out of style. And it's all, it's, so that's what we do. We help those that are walking with us. So you reach back. Now, have a little grace for that person. You know, have a little grace because what they're afraid of, you used to be afraid of too. It's like our kids, you know, they're scared of the dark. You know, it's like, come on guys, there's nothing in here. Boogeyman's not in here. But there's something in your life that's just as irrational that you're just as scared as your kids of the boogeyman. Because fear is a spirit. And so we reach back and help. But you know what? If you only spend your life with people more scared than you, you're going to struggle in the big fearful moments. You better have somebody ahead of you that knows God and trusts God and let God be true and every, everybody else be a liar. You better have somebody that has walked through some battles and some things that can look you in the face and say, the spirit of fear is an operation in you. You don't need to let it dominate you. You better have somebody like that. You know what happened in the Christmas story? Mary hears, now that's big now. All right, you got this baby. It's the savior of the world, don't be afraid. It's the hope for all humanity. Joseph, okay, you're engaged to this girl. You've been faithful in your relationship. Now you got to go back to town. Take her as your wife. We've been faithful. We haven't done anything wrong. The Holy Spirit got her pregnant. 
Don't be scared. What happens to Mary? She goes, some scholars say cousin, others say aunt. We don't know. All we know, Jesus and John the Baptist, there was a connection there. John the Baptist, his cousin Elizabeth, she's a little further in months down the road in this baby thing. Mary, go talk to her. Go talk to her. Makes sense in the natural. You ever been around ladies when they start talking about pregnancy stories? Oh man, I'm like, TMI, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Let me, whoo, yeah, no, uh uh-uh, uterus. Okay, good, all right, praise praise the Lord. Are we allowed to say that in church? Uterus, can we say that? (laughs) You get some ladies up there talking about pregnancy stories. It's like, whoo, I mean, let me tell you about throwing up and then it gets worse from there, you know? (laughs) But she had Elizabeth. Elizabeth was helping her and Elizabeth, the gift of faith can be transferred and can help you in your fear. Do you have anybody like that in your life? Here's the one I really wanted to share with you as I prayed about this. Literally for a year I've been thinking about it, the last few months thinking about what I want to share with you. And I believe we're in a context and a culture and a situation where this is so important. They know they are part of a different kingdom. Let me tell you what happened on Christmas. Guys, don't be afraid. If there's ever a reason to not be afraid, I'm bringing good news, I'm bringing hope, I'm bringing joy, I'm bringing peace. I'm changing the game. This baby represents the initiation of a new kingdom. I'm sorry, I'm preaching, I'm yelling, I'm excited. If we just knew what that meant, a different covenant based on different promises. Not I have to organize my life to make sure that I'm right with God and gain his favor. I have favor through this person, Jesus Christ. I have relationship with the almighty, all-powerful God who rules and reigns over the universe because of now this baby who becomes a man who dies on the cross, who raises from the dead. I am initiating a different kingdom. The baby in the nativity scene grew up And Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. And you know, people who ultimately don't live paralyzed in fear, they know, you know what? I'm under a different king. I'm under a different rule, a different reign. Whatever it is that you're afraid of, I'm under his rule and reign. I live in a different kingdom. By the way, the Bible, most of God's people throughout the Bible lived in caustic situations and scenarios and situations and God took care of them. I live according to a different kingdom. I I, I say this, God will protect us. God will watch over us. We use, use wisdom. I'm not just speaking specifically about health, but even health. If we die, we win. Fear of death is one of the biggest things people face. Well, guess what? We're all going to experience it. The question is not, will we experience it? The question is, how do you experience it? And if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you live forever. You live forever. We don't preach about that enough in today's world. I know we think we've created heaven right here in Dallas-Fort Worth, and if you're not from Texas, you're welcome to the closest thing to heaven. But this is not heaven. This is not our home. I am of a different citizenship. I am a foreigner in an alien place. I am under a different rule and a different king, and I'm going to move from preaching to meddling. The stock market is not the determiner of my financial destiny. It is not the determiner. Thank God when it's up, and thank God for the blessings, and I am an analyzer and understand business, and we need to look at business. But look, 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 look. We live under a different rule. We live under a different kingdom. And you know what? When I want to get afraid, I just remember that there's a king on the throne who's my ultimate leader, who I'm submitted to, and it gives me peace when I want to be afraid because I'm not in charge of my own destiny. I'm under his rule and reign. I want to pray for you. I had a moment this week. My wife and I, we take a little date lunch usually on Thursdays and There's a lady that we're friends with. I'll show you the illustration of it's really not even so much only about 
the amount of messages and amount of maturity and fear is kind of an equal opportunity plaguer. It'll get you. I mean, there are people who have sat in church, they could quote 2 Timothy 1, 7, and they're scared. Why? Because the older you get, the more you have to protect. The more you have to be afraid of, actually. When you're young, you got nothing. So you're just like, well, you know, let's just jump off the cliff. You know, what could happen? I could lose what I don't have. It's a lady who I highly respect, who's highly influential with people, a very bright light, works with people and helps people and knows the word and amazing. She called Brandy, she texted Brandy and I first, we put her on the speakerphone and she said, I just needed you guys to pray with me because for the last several days, I've just been depressed and anxious and just carrying a burden and crying. And I'm like, really, you're the most upbeat person I know. So what's going on? As I start unpacking it, you go back to a Thanksgiving moment at the dessert table where there's a person who she loves and respects and probably well-intended, but doesn't understand being of a different kingdom, doesn't understand not being dominated by a spirit of fear, and says some things to her. Did you know words are powerful? Because a lot of times on the wings of words, the spirit of fear comes. Because it's ultimately what words are you trusting? You can read something on the internet and you could start trusting that as the truth or you can hear something from someone else. And these were words from someone that lodged themselves in her soul. So I just began to talk to her about the spirit of fear, what I'm preaching this weekend. I began to say, those words don't define you. And you have a choice right now to either accept and receive that or anchor yourself to the truth of God's word. I actually had her repeat after me and I reject these things and we prayed the word and we had a moment and it's amazing supernaturally, boom. Because fear is a spirit, it's amazing. In a moment, it's like, wow, I just, boom. And she's back. See, the enemy wanted to keep her during Christmas from being a bright light and helping others and giving life because if he could keep her stuck over here in the words of this person who's dominated by fear, then she could just be ineffective and paralyzed. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And I want to pray for you. If you're watching online or you're in another service, I want to say this. First of all, to receive Jesus, you have to deal with the fear issue. Fear is one of the barriers that the enemy uses to stop you from receiving Jesus. What is it? Well, I mean, what if, well, what if I can't live up to it? What if, what would my friends say? What will, what, what if, what if it's not true? What about this? What about that? Fear is the ba- greatest barrier to you surrendering your life to Jesus, in fact. And so I want those of you who say, look, you're like Jay. I see those stories. I see God moving. I want that. Lord, I pray against a spirit of fear that would stop them from saying yes to you. And Lord, I right now pray that they would receive you. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you right where you are just to say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe you died for me. You rose from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Become my Jesus. Just make it your words. Come into my life in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I'm asking you to let us know. Maybe come to 101. Talk to somebody. Come forward. Send something in online so we can help you start your journey. But I want to pray for a second group of people because I believe there's a second group out there. You're like, I know Jesus. I know Jesus loves me. I know his word is true. But a year ago, God was thinking about you this weekend, right now, fear. An inordinate amount of fear has tried to come into your soul. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that the spirit of fear would be broken. That Lord, you would change their perspective. That every person listening to me under the sound of my voice would say, your word is true. Three times in the Christmas story, we just join right there with it and we receive it like you're speaking it to us. Do not be afraid. We receive your word today, Lord, and break the power of fear on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, typically at this point, 
If you would bear with me for just a moment, we're gonna dismiss in just a second. Typically at this point, I'll turn it over to our team, but I did want to, because of the significance of the step we're at as a church, give you a moment uh, to rejoice, to celebrate, and to look ahead. Uh, For those of you just joining us, um, several months ago, we started a process of expansion. When we moved into this facility, we built this facility to expand by a thousand seats and also to expand our parking and our kids. And uh, not long ago, our church pledged $15.7 million. Thank Thank you for your faithfulness because your faithfulness When you come on campus here at the Keller campus has helped us uh, pay cash for all the parking that you see. They'll start pouring concrete next week on this north lot. So thank God for all of that. We're excited about it. Yeah, you can give God a round of applause for that. And we have to complete all of that before we can start the construction step. Uh, And so some of you are like, why are we waiting till May? It's all part of kind of the timing of the construction. We paused in the very height of some of the things this year that were going on. So we're a little behind schedule, but we are going to break ground in May. All right. So we're excited about that. And we did a little push here to get to $3 million, a little mini goal within the bigger goal, $3 million to break ground. And uh, over the last few weeks during Thanksgiving, thank God for your generosity and his ability to use you. We've received $1.1 million in the last few weeks. So thank you for that. I wanna encourage all of you that we love to say we're in every one church and participate. If you haven't had a chance to participate, you're planning end of year giving. We wanted to get halfway there by the end of the year. I think we can, and we'd be at one and a half million toward that three million. Let me answer one question, give you an announcement and pray for you. Some people would say, well, I look around, I see space. Why do we need to expand? Well, right now, out of respect for people and helping one another and, and, and the things going on in our culture, we're, we're in a socially distanced atmosphere. We've added services. You may not know this, this service you're in, there are people in video venues that are part of our dream team that are serving you by giving you a seat or we wouldn't be able to get everybody in here. We have all of you that are new to the Milestone family that have come during this. Um, welcome, we're glad you're here, all right? But there's still 40 something, 45, 50% of our church that hasn't regathered. Let me tell you about a problem you have that you don't know you have. With all of us that are new and all of us that are old, and I'm not talking about age, but all of us that have been here at Milestone for a little while, when all of us and all of the people regather, which we can't wait for that day, we're gonna have a space problem. So right now we're preparing for that moment to make sure, and you say, why do we do it? Jay. <clears throat> Jay got saved in the video venue. Thank God, he could, you know, God could move in the video venue. Two nights, though, he got a good seat. We're doing it for Jay. That's the whole reason we're doing it. That's why we do what we do. So thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Christmas is coming up, okay? I believe people like never before this year want hope and life and a chance to celebrate uh, Christmas together. So we've added services. We have multiple services. Thank you if you're part of the Milestone family for choosing some of the non-optimal times so that we can get everyone in here, especially Christmas Eve is usually really full. So you might wanna take a photo of that. You might wanna go on our website, look at all those options and, um, and, and choose one of those over the next Uh, several days as we come into Christmas. Invite your friends. People are more open. You know, we talk about Easter in church. Easter's powerful. It's kind of like Super Bowl for pastors, you know what I'm saying? But Christmas is a cultural holiday that touches even people who are outside of the periphery. Easter a lot of times is a worship service for people that believe in the risen King, but Christmas crosses over culturally. So I just wanna give you just, just I, wanna pray, I want you to pray for me, pray for us during this time that we would, would articulate the message of Jesus Christ in a clear way, but I also wanna empower you with, um, people are hurting right now, people have fear, people are struggling. You never know God may use you to be that person who invites someone who becomes the story that we tell when we have our next baptism and celebrate, okay? All right, stand on your feet. I'm gonna ask our ministry team to come down. If you have any need, we'd love to pray for you. And I'm gonna pray a final prayer of blessing. Respect one another as you leave. You may be okay with hugging. They may not let everybody kind of work through. We have the doors open to the side so you can can get out as well easier. Lord, thank you today. 
that you have come as Emmanuel who comes to be with us. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity that there are moments where we might have fear, but we don't have to live in fear. Thank you, Lord, as you lead your people forward, even this week, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.